I think the interesting thing about being a new team in the America's Cup, like we are with Land Rover BAR, is the opportunity to create something slightly different. And certainly, sustainability uh, was an area which uh, 11th Hour Racing actually instilled in me. Sailing is a clean sport, uh, but the oceans are a playing field. We can see the damage that's being done. 11th Hour Racing has become involved because it's really hard to think about looking at a sport like sailing and not wonder what's going on underneath. We need to act, we need to raise awareness to these issues and set the example. If we can do that within our own sport and set that out to other sports and outside to the wider world, then you know, we can really have an effect and, and make the differences required. Mankind are removing tons and tons of fish from the ocean every day. And in order for those that come after us to be able to glean the same bounty that we've received from the oceans, it's something that we need to sit down and talk about. It's nothing that we can just take for granted, take lightly. I don't know a fishery in the world that, that's not under duress right now. By year 2050, there'll be more plastics in the ocean than fish hear about conservation quite often. I think that's rather an old-fashioned word. We're not really conserving something that's in some steady state. We're trying to restore a living system that's been upset for about 100 years, and we need a new language to talk about it. Over the years, people have sort of trusted my sort of judgment on fishy things. In about 2000, somebody brought in a lionfish into one of the agriculture exhibitions in a display tank and said that he'd caught this fish on South Shore. And to us, we knew that this is from the Indo-Pacific. We don't get them here. It opened a whole bunch of questions as to why is it here, how did it get here, and then early on, we saw the damage that they were doing. All of a sudden, the fish that are supposed to be there are gone, and you've got a new fish in its place. You know, it, it's just kind of a red flag and pretty obvious is what's happening. The lionfish are not native to the Caribbean and Western Atlantic. And we put them there artificially. They do produce quite a lot of eggs, 30,000 eggs every four days. If only one of those egg masses survives to reach the next location, then that's enough to establish a new population. In just you know, 20, 30 years, they have expanded immensely from this initial five individuals that were thought to have been dumped from an aquarium into Fort Lauderdale area. Their current range of distribution is all the way from Rhode Island to southern Brazil, inhabiting the entire Western Atlantic. They're eating indiscriminately, and they'll just keep eating until they physically cannot eat anymore. They're eating the fish that clean the reef and keep the reef healthy, and then the reef becomes weaker. The grouper that's living on the same reef now has nothing to eat and doesn't survive. That means there's nothing there for the shark to consume. The lionfish also has no natural predator in the Western Atlantic, so this allows their population again to continue to expand. So the big fear is really that left untouched, we're gonna have a bunch of lionfish and not much other diversity on the reef. Just the introduction of this one individual species can affect everything else in the entire system. You can find videos of what looks like a football field carpeted with lionfish. If you get nightmares, don't watch those videos because they are scary, right? They convince you, holy cow, we got to solve this problem. Some of the locals and fishermen and things here were saying, look, you know, these fish are here. You're never going to eradicate them. But for me, it was very clear early on. It's not an eradication issue. It's a management issue at this point. The ecosystem can adapt, but it's going to take a long time. And so we need to give the ecosystem that buffer so that fish species learn to avoid being consumed by it and other species will learn that it's a potential food source. 
You need everyone working together on this problem. The science institutions, the biological station, the, the Bermuda Aquarium, your fishermen, your government scientists, for all of this to come together to find the solution for this quite critical problem. The lionfish got a bad name because of his looks from the beginning. <laughs> it's not a pretty looking fish. And in Bermuda, we have so much beautiful products coming out of the sea that something new is something that really the public is kind of afraid of. They do have a spooky sort of creepy uh, look to them. They don't scream out, eat me, <laughs> like, like other fish might. So there might be somewhat of a stigma associated to lionfish here in Bermuda. We had some meat sent away to a couple of uh, labs to get tested. and actually came back quite high in omega-3s and selenium, which is why we eat fish, and very low in heavy metals because it does grow quite fast. They have low cholesterol. They are low in saturated fats. They're not very high in calories. And so in comparison to other protein options, such as beef, Lionfish really provide a low fat and delicious way to get your protein that's gonna be healthy for you. Be able to get that into the food chain for humans would take a, an enormous amount of pressure off of other overfish species and could replace possibly fish that's being overfished for sushi, for example. The thing is that there, there's plenty of demand. People like lionfish, it tastes great. The restaurants want to cook it, um, but we just can't get them enough fish. Philippe Ruja and Jeff Gardner contacted me and said that we've got some people that want to go out and do a special dive. Colin Angle and his wife Erica were the guests on the boat that day. And I'm looking at little beasties and looking for algae and things like that. And on that dive, we actually caught a couple of lionfish. When we got back to the boat, of course, Colin said, you know, what's the deal with these lionfish? Basically, he'd said, look, I think we can make robots to help you guys deal with this. You know, the first thought was, well, could that possibly work? You know, I'm sure we could make a robot that could catch a lionfish, but so what? If I, you know, I had a $200,000, $500,000 robot catching a single lionfish, that's not going to have any impact on an invasive species of the magnitude and, and challenge of the lionfish. So the real question was, could we do it cheaply? Here you go, but for this quick test. We can build it to go find those colonies at 200 feet or 300 feet, where divers can't comfortably go very different approach, right? Low-cost robotics is, in effect, a, a new toolkit that we've never had before. We have this new set of capabilities, and applying it to the environment, which is a passion of mine, sort of made sense. Something we're really clear about is we will not solve this problem alone. We need probably thousands, maybe 10,000 of these robots in the water. The only way that's ever going to happen is if it's economically interesting to the person putting it in the water, the fisherman. So we believe, and we've modeled it out, that you know this device can catch enough fish in a day to make a fisherman's lifestyle work. So ultimately, our robot will cost less than $1,000, and it can dive deep in the ocean. Within 10 years, I could see you know fishermen having a fleet of these robots, and they throw them overboard, and they come back at the end of the day and blow it up on the lionfish, and they can take it to market. The nice thing about the robot is that it's species specific, so the only thing it's collecting is lionfish, so there's no error on uh, bycatch. And I think that's gonna be key to sort of keeping the industry going. People often ask, how are we gonna be sure people don't capture other fish? Well, all the other fish are smarter. They skitter away. They won't let you get close. The lionfish has these interesting behavioral characteristics that help us a lot. They don't ever, ever get aggressive. They put their head down and they put their, their spines out like this, saying, don't touch me, and that's it. That's as defensive as they get. You know, these fish don't move out of the way, even at a, the sight of another predator. They are just bold enough to say, come and get me. <laughs> and, and there we do. The easiest way to explain it is it's a PlayStation game. You have a controller in your hand, you look at a screen, you drive the robot around, and instead of capturing some bad alien in a game, you're actually capturing a bad alien in the sea that doesn't belong there and creating an opportunity. So this is our system, sort of our development system, uh, just to get things sorted out really quickly. What, 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 do, we, what do we want to build? Is, you know, how big does it have to be? What's too big? As a foundation, we want to do good for the environment. So we don't want to have anything about this device 
cause any other harm. The name Robots in Service of the Environment was explicitly chosen because it has some of that conflict laid out in the title. Yep, we build robots, and yes, we are in service of the environment. We'd be all wrong if we created a device that could be used willy-nilly and do damage out there in the ocean. The lionfish robot is something that can accomplish a solution a, a human being really can't do. How many lionfish can a single person catch? Certainly in the public imagination, there's anxiety about automation, about robots, self-driving cars, artificial intelligence. Technology can be somewhat of a double-edged sword. So I think as long as we can use it in a responsible way, then technology can be a great tool to advance conservation and research. So all you chefs out there, please help people eat those lionfish. There's a whole community of chefs out there. They've been working for 30 years on sustainability issues, and they're thrilled to be sort of the pioneers in developing a public awareness campaign about this particular fish and how versatile and useful it is. The cook-off with 11th Hour with all the celebrity chefs, I mean, it's a great idea to be able to sort of promote the fish to the general public. I mean, you know, if the chefs start using it and make it a hip thing and sort of educate people on why it's a hip thing, the, the public will start to get it and move for it. Six acclaimed chefs will be competing, and um, each chef has to use lionfish as an ingredient. And so I've just made a little ceviche. I've marinated the fish in some lime. What the chefs did is they adapted it to their own sense of cooking and it, it made a really lovely presentation. They covered a, the entire spectrum of what you can do with fish, from sushi to ceviche to just being sauteed up in a pan with olive oil. So we've got a lionfish ceviche, a coconut lionfish curry, and lionfish and chips as, you know, classic Woo! UK dish. So when Delicious and fresh product, treating it with technique. If we recognize that lionfish is incredible, and we put that on our plates instead, I think that's where the real win happens. That's the game Iron Culinary dropped this from me. Oh, everybody, you deserve it. You did a lot of work. Oh! Atlantic caught lionfish ends up being a greener than green choice because there is no downfall to over-harvesting and consuming as many as possible. Everyone's looking for that perfect fish, the fish you can eat without any guilt whatsoever, and lionfish has literally given us that on a, a silver platter. For people to know that there is a sustainable, delicious creature out there that just needs a way to be caught is, is eye-opening. We won't get rid of lionfish, but if we can use lionfish as, as an example to teach people about the dangers of invasive species, then we may have staved off something else. Can we use this to amplify and educate new generations to say, this is what happens when you release the wrong creature or the wrong plant in the wrong environment? When you look at the larger issues with the environment, again, it's going to require teamwork, people understanding the issues, coming together. It's not, not individuals that are going to solve this, it's, it's the global community that have got to come together and, and tackle these challenges. And it will take time, but it's doable. And if we act now and we act in the, in the right way and in a responsible way, we can make a real difference. One of my favorite things to do is hop out in the boat and go out to Woody's, uh, grab a fish sandwich there, so a Wahoo fish sandwich, hop back in the boat and go and watch all the America's Cup boats racing. It's a good day out. They come worldwide, from worldwide to get our sandwiches. They love our sandwiches. Thank you, Jesus, for that, but... <laughs> I could eat those every day. It's just have a beer, have a fish sandwich, fantastic. You know, any fish sandwich is a good fish sandwich. Best fish sandwich is made is by me. <laughs> um, go to the dock, fillet it up, bring it up to the restaurant, and cook it fresh that day. When you put that in a frying pan, 
and you make a fish sandwich, man, you don't need nothing better than that. I like mine on raisin bread, freshly baked raisin bread, slightly toasted, uh, with a bit of tartar sauce, slice of lemon, and usually coleslaw. If you can get fresh Bermuda onions that are just fried up perfectly on that grill, then you've got the perfect sandwich. The hope is that lionfish will become the premier fish in Bermuda, that people will go in search of a lionfish sandwich uh, when they come to Bermuda, or recognize that, hey, I'm in Bermuda, I should get a lionfish sandwich. They're known for the best lionfish sandwiches in the greater Caribbean. We are here to eat them, to beat them. That's, that's, that's our motto in Bermuda, eat them to beat them.